Welcome back to the bird park. I'm now shooting myself on my smartphone with a uh, Boya microphone mounted on top, so the audio should be pretty good. I don't know about the picture though. And uh, I also have my camera with me, but now I have a macro telephoto lens mounted on it. For all you camera geeks out there, it's a 60 millimeter, but since this is micro four thirds, it's the equivalent of 120 millimeter and it's a macro. So if you know what you're doing, you can zoom down and get pictures of an ant's eyeball and stuff like that. It's really powerful, but it's a very complicated lens to use and I've never really mastered it. I, I don't know how to use it, but uh, we're gonna give it a try. I'm gonna take my second walk around the park and see if I can get some close-up shots of uh, some of the butterflies. Um, after I had my coffee in the uh, coffee shop, I just turned around and came back in and Technically, I guess you're not supposed to do that Every door had a big sign on it saying no entry and anyone caught entering the park this way will be charged double but like I said, I I bought a ticket to come in and I just want to sit down and have a drink and then continue looking around the park but there's really no way to do that inside the park you kind of have to go out to their gift shop, have a drink, and then come back in. So anyway, that's what I did. We'll see what happens. second trip through the bird park is quickly turning into a experimental photography trip. I'm trying to learn how to use my macro lens on my camera. And that's a steep learning curve. I have no idea what I'm doing. I've had the cam I've had the lens for years, but I've never really mastered it. It takes a to to really use it to its fullest potential it takes a lot of skill and practice and knowledge and I have none of those things, but we'll see how it goes. Finding that, uh, as always, it was a good idea to get here early. I mean, I was here at 9 a.m. just as the park opened, and I had the whole place to myself, and the butterflies were very active. Now it's, uh, it's almost 12 o'clock, and there are far few butterflies out flying about. The feeding sites are more empty, and uh, bus tours are showing up.
It's midday now, it's quite hot, and the butterflies seem to have decided to take a break for the most part. There's still butterflies around, but not nearly as many as there were this morning. I think I'm going to take one last stroll around the perimeter and then head into the education center where it's air conditioned and see what's uh, going on in there. I'm inside the education center now. It's really uh, quite extensive, I'm surprised. The number of uh, species that they have here, spiders and beetles, butterflies, moths, just about everything you can think of. Uh, the walking stick, snakes, scorpions, giant uh, millipedes, and they have a lot of live specimens here too. They're not all just uh, mounted. They have some cages with uh, living scorpions, snakes, even a walking stick. So yeah, it's a cool place. I like it. These guys are among my favorite insects, the cicadas or cicadas. We have them in Canada by the millions. And on a hot summer night, they can make a, no a noise loud enough to almost deafen you. I knew that there were walking sticks inside this cage. And even though I knew that, it took me forever to recognize that this guy up at the top was a walking stick. Even when I got right up on him, I couldn't quite tell if it was a twig, a stick, or uh, the actual insect. They have a perfect camouflage. And these are some much bigger walking sticks, much thicker bodies. And these guys are very cool. They're snakes and they're green. And when you look at the sign on their cage, you'll never guess what they're called. They are called green snake. So some biologist burned a few brain cells trying to come up with that name. And here are the giant rhinoceros beetles. I assume they have them in Malaysia. I remember seeing them quite often in uh, Taiwan. People had them as pets. And for my money, these are the scariest insects on the planet. Not so much because they're so poisonous or so aggressive, but just the way they look. Scorpions, they look like they're designed for battle, designed to uh, sting you and eat you up. They're probably friendly creatures, really, but... Uh, I remember when I was in countries that had a lot of scorpions, I made it a habit to knock my shoes on the ground before I put them on in the morning because scorpions like to climb inside your shoes and uh, sleep there at night. And you put your foot in in the morning and that's when you get uh, stung. Love these guys too. I saw a lot of them in Indonesia, giant millipedes. I stayed at one hotel where these guys would come into my room all the time. I don't know what it was, but there was something in my room that attracted them and they would sneak in under the door and I'd have to chase them out all the time. Wow, look at this. I thought I'd seen their uh, collection, but there's an entire room full of beetles and butterflies that I hadn't even seen yet.
that's it. The KL Butterfly Park. Done and done. I'm outside the park now and uh, walking back uh, to my hostel. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. I had a good time, but of course I'm, I'm fascinated by butterflies and insects in general. So it was a great place for me. Would I recommend it for other people? Overall, yeah, I would. It depends on your situation. I wouldn't fly around the world to come here, but if you're in Kuala Lumpur and you know you're living in a hostel close to it like I am, and you have 25 ringgit burning a hole in your pocket, yeah, I think it's really worth it. Especially when you take into account the butterfly park itself and then the educational center because their display of insects from around the world is quite impressive. I've been to similar places in other countries and the insect collection tends to suffer a lot because of uh, neglect and humidity. Things just fall apart and they just leave them that way. But this uh, display is very well maintained. All the insects and butterflies are in amazing condition. It's air conditioned and probably humidity controlled, you know, to keep everything uh, nice and uh, in good shape. So that seeing all of that along with the butterfly park itself yeah, definitely makes it uh, worthwhile. There are a few quirks to this park, I think. One is definitely get here first thing in the morning when it's cool. The butterflies are far more active. They're everywhere. Even by 11 o'clock, 10.30, they're already hiding and there's not nearly as much activity. So if you show up late in the afternoon, you're probably not going to have as good an experience. So get here early. A few other things to be aware of, perhaps. I mean, they advertise 120 species. I can guarantee you there are not 120 species of butterfly flying around in the park. I couldn't tell you how many exactly. I mean, there's enough for me. But if you're in there counting, you're not going to get the 120. Maybe they're including all of the species in the education center, like all the mounted specimens, as well as the ones in the park. Maybe that gets them to 120. But if you go in there expecting 120 species and all the brightest, most brilliant butterflies in the world, you're not going to see that. You'll see enough, I think, but you're not going to see that. <laughs> the butterfly park is also showing its age a little bit. When you go inside, all the facilities have been there for a long time, you know, like the two bathrooms are quite old and falling apart. In fact, today there was no water at all. No water flowing in the toilets, no water flowing in the sinks. And there was a sign apologizing for that. You know, sorry, we don't have any water. But uh, there you go. And a lot of everything in there is, is kind of showing it's been around for a few years in this humid climate, mold and moss. And uh, it's not spick and span and brand new. So that's something to be aware of, I guess. One last thing to consider about the butterfly park, and here I'm kind of comparing it to the bird park, where in the bird park there was tons of staff everywhere, and inside the park in particular they were very friendly, they were smiling, engaging with the birds, engaging with the visitors, you could talk to them, and you got a good social feeling from the bird park. Not so at the butterfly park. You go inside and you're pretty much on your own. There are no staff in there other than um, some groundskeepers, you know, who are sweeping and watering the plants. But in terms of uh, you have a question about a butterfly's natural habitat or behavior, you're not going to find anyone there that's going to be able to tell you anything. If there isn't a sign telling you, you're not going to find out and the women that are running the ticket counter and the little drinks booth inside and the souvenir shop, you're not going to get a smile and a welcome out of them either. <laughs> I can tell you that. You're lucky if you can find them in order to pay them for a cold drink. They're off hiding in a corner somewhere looking at their phones. So it's not the kind of place that has a real welcoming atmosphere. Doesn't feel like a happening attraction with all kinds of happy emotions. This isn't, a, this isn't Disneyland. The staff are not being paid to smile. They're being paid to sit there and, and take money, and that's pretty much all they do. Which is fine, but something to be aware of. The best thing about the park for me 
were the uh, feeding stations. That was by far the best and the nicest touch where they had those little trays with the flowers on them sprayed with honey and then some pineapples and that attracted so many butterflies and you could see them up close. Without those it would have been a very different experience because most of the butterflies were flying high up near the netting or in the corners or, or in the trees and you wouldn't see them that uh, clearly but uh, having those feeding stations really made the difference. I'm back inside my favorite tunnel, as you can see, slowly making my way back to the hostel from the uh, butterfly park. Another thought I had about the park and the lack of staff inside is that there was nobody controlling the behavior of visitors. And it wasn't a problem in the morning, but as I pointed out, if I kept those clips in the video, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. But there were some bus tours arriving, and these people were a little bit aggressive for the, for the uh, butterfly park. Their behavior was a little bit inappropriate, a little loud, a little bit, you know, handling the butterflies, grabbing them, picking them up by the wings, and doing other strange things, hitting the feeding tables to make the butterflies fly into the air. This is all stuff that, had there been staff, they probably would have stopped them. But since there was nobody around to tell them what to do and what not to do, you got a little bit of a bit of a negative atmosphere when the big bus tours came through. Another reason for showing up early in the morning, and you can miss all of that. And I think that is it for my experience of the KL Butterfly Park. I hope you enjoyed that a little bit. It'll be interesting to see all the video clips on my computer because I had a heck of a time with this camera and with my phone. Nothing works, the focusing is all screwed up, but uh, you know, I shot a lot so maybe if I go through and pick the best of the best, I can get a couple of nice shots of some of the butterflies. I hope so. I hope there's a few in there anyway. So that's uh, me in Kuala Lumpur on a Sunday. And uh, I will see you in the next video. The bonus question for the last video was about butterflies. I pointed out that butterflies can be great travelers, and one butterfly from Canada migrates 3,000 miles to Mexico. What is the name of that butterfly? Answer. That butterfly is the monarch. The monarch has one of the most fascinating life cycles in nature. It's way too complicated to go into in detail, but the basic idea is that there are four generations of monarchs every year, and the first three generations live normal lifespans of between two and six weeks. But the fourth generation, which uh, comes out in the fall is like a super generation. It is the generation that goes on the migration to Mexico and it can live for up to six to eight months. To put that into perspective, imagine if humans had this kind of a life cycle. You live for about 70 years, your children live for about 70 years, your grandchildren live for about 70 years, but then the fourth generation your great-grandchildren, they suddenly are a super generation. They live for 500 years and they do something extraordinary with their lives. Then we go back to regular 70-year lifespans and this repeats over and over again. It just blows my mind to think about it. One of the reasons I love insects. The bonus question for this video is a very simple one. I think everybody knows the answer, but maybe not, so here goes. How many legs do insects have? Put your answer in the comments below. Answer at the end of the next video. Found a little waterfall here, coming, coming out of a tree of all places. Ah, all kinds.
kinds of wildlife. We've got a uh, little frog sitting on the rock over here. Oh, there he goes. Travel tip 22 is to buy an adapter with built-in USB charging ports. There are many different types of adapters on the market, and which one is right for you depends on a lot of factors, such as what country you're from, and what countries you're going to, and how many different countries. But a very popular adapter is one like I'm holding here, just called a universal adapter, which in theory allows you to plug in any device from any country into any outlet in any country. Whether a universal adapter is right for you is a big topic, and that's for another day. My tip is, if you're going to buy a universal adapter, consider getting one with these. Two USB charging ports built right into it. This can come in very handy because a lot of budget hotels only have one electrical outlet. You might have a USB charger for your phone or for your tablet, but if you only have one outlet, you plug in your computer to charge it up. Now you can't plug in your charger because you've already taken up that outlet with your computer. But if you have one of these, you can plug it into the wall, plug your computer into here, and then you have two USB charging ports to plug in whatever other devices you want. So these new adapters with the charging ports can come in very handy. 